shot most of our Bolivian sequences in Talayacap in Mexico, about 30 miles south of Cuernavaca. In colonial days, it was a main stop on the stagecoach run between Acapulco and Mexico City. But now it was mostly a farming community. The first scene we shot there was a sequence where Edda teaches the guy Spanish. Catherine had very decided opinions on how to play her part. She's a very intelligent girl, but I didn't always agree with her. Actually, my communication with her was the least good uh, of any of the actors, and it led at times to uncomfortable moments on the set. But ultimately, if an actor or an actress has talent and a strong set of convictions, and persuasion can't move them, uh, sometimes it's better just to back off and go with them, uh, rather than create a situation where neither one of you gets what you want. Of course, in the final analysis, the director's working relationship with the actors is terribly important in the making of any film. I have a feeling that George probably dressed with a much tighter hand uh, than he did on this picture. I think he kept a fairly loose one. Just as I kept a fairly loose, uh, I thought George was terribly rigid when, I first, when we first started rehearsing. And yet, as the days of rehearsal went on, <clears throat> I realized that he really had points to make. They may have been
seen, of course, is the effect that the massacre has on the guys, and particularly on Butch, and the ironic fact that in going straight, he's had to kill, uh, which is something he never had to do as an outlaw. And then it goes down. The... I wanted to achieve a very special effect in the killing. I wanted to have the bandits hit and fall in a series of uh, overlapping images in which they seem to be falling out of themselves. two cameras on the same angle, over-cranking one and under-cranking the other. And when I had them all put together optically, it was really a fantastic effect, but unfortunately, it was utterly wrong for the scene. It became uh, balletic and beautiful, but not in the least horrifying. Uh, since basically, I think a director's obligation is to make a scene work and not his effects, I threw it out and just used the slow motion dying. I wasn't particularly happy with that just by itself because it's become a cliché to shoot death in that manner, but at least it made the point of the scene better than the more spectacular version, and I had no choice. Most of the time I go into a sequence knowing generally what I want in staging and setups, but uh, still... <coughs> Bless you! Yes. But in a complicated action sequence, uh, such as our shootout here in the end, I think you have to work it out very specifically in action and camera angles, or you'll get hopelessly messed up in the cutting room later on. I spent <coughs> shot the yes. scene out on the location along with our second unit director, Mickey Moore, and our art director, Phil Jeffries, planning the staging and the camera angles shot for shot. As we worked our way through it, I also wrote down the cutting pattern. I planned <coughs> the yes. and Phil drew out a visual continuity guide for uh, camera position and, and for moves. Which, and Sundance shot it out with the Bolivian cavalry was a much more confined location than the one we actually picked here. Uh, you can't follow the script very closely when you come to an action situation like this. Uh, you have to invent your activities to take advantage of the location you've got. In this case, in order to give our guys some cover on their dash across the courtyard, <coughs> we turned this little square into a marketplace and we put these stalls all around the sides. Uh, so we could give a Paul and, and Bob some place to dive and to take cover. When the actors came on the set the first day of shooting the scene, we went through the entire sequence and discussed the action. A uh, rehearsal period on this kind of scene can take anywhere from <coughs> four hours yes. or more, uh, making sure that the actors and your key men know exactly where you're all going. But even within the context of a, a specifically laid out scenes such as this one, you try to keep as loose as possible. If you have really inventive actors like Bob <coughs> and Paul, uh, they often can come up with an idea that's better than yours, or at least can trigger you onto something else, and you've got to keep yourself in a position to take advantage of it. At the same time, practically speaking, I uh, personally have got to have the security of a blueprint of the scene in my pocket, uh, because having a whole crew standing around at the rate of close to $5,000 an hour while you're doing your homework on the set is a kind of a luxury that uh, pictures just can't afford anymore. Another thing about Paul and Bob that I've almost never run across with major stars before was their willingness, uh, actually their eagerness to come in and rehearse on their days off. We did that on many occasions throughout the film so that we wouldn't waste valuable crew time while we were working out our scenes. But on this kind of an action situation, the crew has to be there to plan the special effects details as you go along. In any sequence involving guns, of course, you've got to rig the hits. Uh, our special effects man here is, is wiring the table for the first bullet hit. He's built a hole in it, he's stuck a charge in it, and uh, he's wired it to his battery. And his assistant has another set of wires running from the battery to his fingertips. In the scene, the guys sit down at the table to get served their dinners. And on cue, he sets off the charge with one hand and fires the gun with the other. When the bullet hits on the wall alongside them on close shots, we sometimes put explosives in the wall itself. Mostly we use these air guns 
is fired by special effects crew off camera. They can fire blood pellets and dust pellets, and you obviously save a lot of time with them rather than setting individual charges. They're amazingly accurate. A difficult and dangerous part of this sequence was getting Paul riding between the horse and the mule across the square. Stars doing their own stunt work is all right up to a point, but it's always risky to let them get into really dangerous physical situations, because if they get hurt, the whole production might have to shut down, waiting for them to get patched up and back to work. But in this case, we had to get some close-ups of him riding between them, and he did them for us. For the wider shots, we were able to use Jimmy Arnett, uh, Paul's stunt double. To get the mule to fall, we used a technique that's illegal in the United States called a flying W. The mule's front feet are wired, and the wires run up through the saddle and out back. The mule gets up a good run, and the wrangler jerks the wires and pulls his front feet out from under him, and he goes over on his face. Uh, there's a chance of breaking the animal's neck in this technique, but fortunately we didn't. Gunfights in westerns are always phony because the heroes shoot endlessly without reloading. So in laying out this sequence, I incorporated several definite times when Bob actually had to stop and reload before he went on, and I made a special point of them. I wanted the audience to accept the fact that we were being absolutely realistic, because actually for the dramatic effect of this final burst of firing, I wanted to take the license of letting him continue to fire without reloading, so long as it was dramatically effective. Actually, in our final cut, I never counted the number of shots he takes after his last reloading, but it must be close to 15, 18 times. Jimmy Arnett, Paul's stunt double, was the corregidor on top of the arch shooting at Bob. On this particular take, he took too long to fall, but I wasn't quick enough to cut and to stop him before he went. He took the fall onto a stack of cardboard boxes concealed behind that wall, but they weren't strong enough to break the fall, and he went through them under the cobblestones and fractured his pelvis. Uh, it took him almost three months to get back working again. I 
Holy babe. What's good? Marshall. How's practice? Oh, practice was good. Cool. Just pretty much, yeah, it was fun. Bunch of tackle drums being hit. The drum was being hit. Wow. One, oh, we discovered one of the drums has a hole in it. Oh, the, the one skins? Of the, one of our practice drums. In the skins or the wood? In the skins. Oh, that. Right in the middle. Well, that's got to happen. That's more than in a drum. Think. I mean, you're hitting it with a stick. We're supposed to hit the middle. Yeah. And eventually, Hey, where where, what's it made of? Uh, cowhide. Okay. Wow, that's pretty cool. Stretched cowhide. It's very old school. Like a pirate ship. Yeah, very old school. That's cool. Very old school. Wow. There's no plant-based version yet. Say what? There's no plant-based version yet. No. No plant-based <laughs> version of cowhide yet. <laughs> Good. shooting. Then we removed the motion picture camera 
and took a still shot of the whole set with nobody in it. And this had to be done quickly so that the shadows on the closer 35 millimeter shot would match the wider still photograph. Then back at the studio, we froze the 35 millimeter action as they came running out, took this last frozen frame, bled all the color out of it down to a sepia, and pasted it into a blow up of the 8x10 still of the set. Then we rephotographed it on an animation board, pulled back to reveal Paul and Bob now as a part of a still photograph of the whole scene. I have now spent exactly a year and three months on this film, and at this point, I don't know yet how it's going to be received. I think it's a good film. I think the guys are great at it, and I think the relationships work. Uh, it was a hell of a lot of hard work doing it, and actually even more fun. And if the audiences don't take it, I, uh, I think I'm going to have fun. That was on uh, Amazon. Amazon. Oh, that's right. We do have Amazon Prime.